I'm so, so glad to see you all here tonight. Um, and I know we had a lot of competition with the Met Gala on the same evening, so thank you for choosing us. <laughs> um, but how many of you have been on a tour here at the Tenant Museum before? Just get a sense, oh, wonderful. Um, so as many of you know, um, at the Tenant Museum, we tell the stories, um, the uniquely American stories, in fact, of immigrants, migrants, and refugees in the ongoing creation of our nation. And if you have been on a tour here um, to hear about one of the families who lived in this building, 103 Orchard Street, or our tenement down the block at 97 Orchard Street, um, you'll know that one of the main historic records that we use to learn about the families who called these buildings home um, is a census record. So we use census records uh, to learn the names of the people who lived in our buildings, uh, what countries they were born in, um, what languages they spoke, um, and to get at at least one aspect of um, an understanding of uh, who they were. Now, many of the people who lived in this building, who lived in 97 Orchard Street, um, were not US citizens, um, did not speak English as their first language, um, and weren't recognized generally by dominant society or by traditional American history textbooks. So even more important then that we see their names on this historic record of the census, um, both for their time and for people like us, future historians, um, working to understand who they were um, using the census. So tonight we are so excited to have here um, a panel of um, people with immense expertise in the census, both past and present. And our conversation tonight will um, touch on many topics. We are in a particularly important moment preparing for the census uh, next year. And so we will um, discuss the proposed citizenship question. Uh, many of you might be familiar that um, two weeks ago, the Supreme Court um, heard oral arguments on this proposed citizenship question. Um, we will discuss uh, the risks and dangers of an undercount and the work that is going on for outreach to prevent an undercount and ensure that as many New Yorkers as possible um, are counted next year. So our conversation will take us uh, in many directions and um, after the conversation wraps up, we will open uh, the floor to all of you. Um, something we really cherish about our talks here at the Tenement Museum is being able to invite um, the audience into the conversation. So we'll make sure to leave enough room at the end to hear your thoughts and questions. So it is now my honor to introduce our panelists tonight, um, beginning with Azia Badi. Um, Azia works as the New York Census Director for M-Gage, a civic engagement organization. Um, prior to M-Gage, Azia worked at the New York Academy of Medicine, where she provided strategic assistance to neighborhoods, communities, and civic organizations looking to address the social determinants of health. In addition, Azia currently holds a borough present president appointment to Manhattan's Community Board 6, where she is vice chair of the board. Azia is vice chair of Bellevue Hospital's Community Advisory Board and has been elected president of the Samuel J. Tilden Democratic Club, where she is the first Muslim woman in New York City elected president of a local Democratic Club. Julie Menon. Uh, as an attorney and civic leader with over two decades of experience in the legal, regulatory, and public sectors, uh, Julie currently serves as Census Director for New York City and Executive Assistant to Corporation Council for Strategic Advocacy. Previously, she served as Commissioner of the Department of Consumer Affairs, the Commissioner of the Mayor's Office of Media and Entertainment prior to that. She also uh, served as the seven-year chair of Community Board One and is widely credited with helping to lead Lower Manhattan's resurgence after 9-11. Menon previously taught as an adjunct professor of law and public policy at Columbia University, where she also serves on the board of trustees. Next, we have Ken Pruitt, who is the Carnegie Professor of Social Affairs at Columbia University's School of International and Public Affairs, where he is also director of the Scholarly Knowledge Project. He was director of the United States Census Bureau from 1998 to 2001. He is the author of numerous publications, most recently the book, What is Your Race? The Flawed Effort of the Census to Classify Americans. And our final panelist tonight is Joseph J. Salvo, who is New York City's chief demographer. His staff in the population division at the Department of City Planning provides data and analytical expertise to agencies on needs assessments, program planning and targeting, and policy formulation. 
He has testified before Congress, been an advisor to the Census Bureau, served on panels at the National Academy of Sciences, and most recently was an expert witness in the citizenship lawsuit headed by the New York Attorney General. He has co-authored articles on settlement patterns of race and ethnic groups, census methods, and survey evaluation. Dr. Salvo is presently leading a team making technical preparations for the 2020 census and is active nationally in promoting the use of methods that will provide a more accurate census count of the city's population. And moderating our conversation tonight will be my colleague David Favaloro, who is the Director of Curatorial Affairs and the Hebrew Technical Institute Research Fellow here at the Tenement Museum. He is jointly responsible for interpreting the history of the tenements at 97 and 103 Orchard Street, with an emphasis on research and exhibit development. He also oversees the museum's preservation, conservation, and collections management programs. He holds a Master's of Arts in American History and an Advanced Certificate in Public History from the University of Massachusetts Amherst. So without further ado, I'm going to turn it over to David David to get our conversation started. Great, thank you, Kat. Um, well, to say that uh, the census infuses our work here at the museum would be an understatement and uh, in a sort of joking way, right? Um, my wife always tells me that occasionally I talk about the census in my sleep, so I don't know if anyone <laughs> on the panel has that. Um, has that problem as well, but it's a good problem, right? Uh, we're gonna structure tonight's program a little bit differently than um, some panels you all may have been to in the past, uh, rather than inviting all of our panelists to speak um, from their area of expertise uh, individually, sequentially. Uh, I'm gonna raise a number of questions and then invite uh, one of the panelists to sort of comment on that first and then we'll sort of hand it off whoever wants to kind of go after that, if, uh, if you will. So uh, we're going to start really in, um, in the present, and I'm sure we'll talk about the historic um, component of the census and what it means to, um, uh, to the work we're doing. Uh, but uh, again, we really want to sort of begin in the present uh, with the question of, uh, from the panelist's perspective, what is the current state of the 2020 census? So uh, we'll start with Julie Menon, if you I think you should Sure. Uh, is the mic working? Yes. Okay, okay wonderful. Uh, well, thank you very much for having me today. So we're all very happy to be speaking about the census because, and this is not an overstatement to say, I honestly believe this is the most important issue that the city of New York faces right now because it's going to affect our funding and our political representation for the next decade. What is the state of the 2020 census? We're dealing with an unprecedented situation. You've heard a little bit about the citizenship lawsuit. The city law department, where I also work, is a plaintiff on this lawsuit. I was in DC about a week and a half ago for the oral arguments at the Supreme Court. Uh, while we won a resounding legal victory at the district court level and the Attorney General's office is um, uh, leading the charge and the city law department has uh, joined forces there, um, it's obviously a very tough battle because of the political constitution right now of the Supreme Court. Um, with that said, this is why the city of New York is making an unprecedented investment in the census. So I'm happy to say that last week, Mayor de Blasio announced um, that he was going to be allocating $26 million for our office. And this really is unprecedented. In 2010, the city of New York did not have this kind of outreach effort. They had Joe, who we'll be speaking in a little bit, who is a treasure in terms of the census. But they didn't have an outreach operation, and that's really what we we need to do uh, right now. Um, in 2010, the city's response rate on the census and that self-response rate was 61.9%. That compares to a national average of 76%. The borough of Brooklyn was at 54%. So why does this matter? Because close to $800 billion of federal funds each and every year are allocated to cities and states across the country for programs that are dependent on the census. So everything from public education, public housing, senior centers, Medicaid, this is really why I say it's one of the most important issues. And then lastly, I'll end with the political representation piece. Obviously, 
This is so important for political representation. Why was the citizenship question asked? Well, it was asked, and that question hasn't been on the census for 70 years. It was asked in large part to try to intimidate immigrant communities in cities throughout the United States and to basically switch funding to red states that do not have large immigrant populations. That's a very candid assessment of what is going on. And that is why we have so much at stake, and that is why we have to ensure that every single New Yorker fills out the census. There's a lot more I can say, but I'm in the interest of time, I'm gonna stop there. Anyone else want to comment? to go into, um, oh, it doesn't sound like it's on, but it is on, okay. Um, so um, I work with um, Engage, and Engage is a national organization really focused on Muslim voter um, registration, civic advocacy, and leadership development. And the census became a big concern to us because we saw what was happening within the Muslim community. Um, and rapidly, like the Muslim community is gonna be what is considered a hard to count community. Um, given the, the federal sort of anti-immigration, anti-refugee sort of stance, um, the rising, um, like the Muslim ban that actually occurred, as well as just your, the, the census question, as well as sort of rising Islamophobia. Many of the Muslims really um, are very fearful, and there is like a general mistrust of the government, as well as anything that could be considered a registry. And I think um, understanding that that fear is happening because of sort of the rhetoric that is happening nationally, um, we needed to work sort of locally in communities to build trust and build understanding of the importance of the census and why we need to participate participate for um, the long term, like for the next decade, this is going to impact our communities and we need to participate in a way to make sure our voices are heard. Did you have some hand raised? Yeah. yeah um, the census is not only about response, it's about self-response. Since 1970, the uh, census has been predicated on people responding on their own, okay? Um, <clears throat> why is that the case? Why is it important? Um, Self-response, um, when you look at the, at the data that's collected, is of the highest quality um, of, of all the information collected in the census. When self-response drops, you start opening the door to all kinds of error. Error associated with the fact that you're encountering, obviously, increased resistance. Um, that error comes in many forms, but I'll give you one illustration of a particular type of error. Um, when a household does not respond and the Census Bureau sends someone out, that person is charged with getting a person on the other end who is reluctant to so respond on their own, to provide you with data. Frequently, the Census Bureau will go to what are called proxy respondents, next door neighbors, people on the block who kind of know that there are people in that basement. Um, you know, what I always tell people is when you go out and they ask how many people are in the basement and they go to the landlord, the landlord first thing says, what basement? All right, and the next door neighbors, uh, proxy respondents are not a great source of information. In 2010, there was a part of Northwest Queens, Astoria, piece of Jackson Heights, where the Census Bureau went out and sent people into the field to collect data from people who had not self-responded. And what ended up happening was that a large number of the housing units probably out of frustration by the enumerators, were deemed to be vacant. We had huge increases in vacant housing units in Northwest Queens, where a single block would have you know, 15, 20 vacant units, for example. A whole part of Southern Brooklyn, the whole Southern Brooklyn tier, experienced an increase in, in vacant housing units. The way to prevent something like that is to get the people in those housing units to respond to begin with. And when they respond, generally speaking, you will not open the door to these kinds of errors. There are a whole number of errors. I spent uh, my time with this in the lawsuit documenting what happens when self-response 
begins to go down. What happens when people do not self-respond? So as Julie just said, it's important for people, and uh, we're gonna put, have a big push for people to respond in the city, but it's just as important to have people self-respond um, for the reasons I've laid out. And, and again, since 1970, the census is primarily a self-response instrument. When it ceases to be that, you open the door to all kinds of problems and you compromise data and potentially compromise the count itself. Anyone have anything to add to that? Yeah. Well, I'm gonna, uh, yeah. Um, I'm gonna go back to 1790, um, why not? Uh, because I wanna give you the big sweep of, of stuff. Um, uh, the census in 1790 counted 3.9 million people. Uh, the President of the United States, George Washington, was angry. He said that we are more than that. And he said um, that uh, the reason that we only counted that many people is that we had lazy um, uh, numerators <laughs> uh, who didn't do the job, and some people just re didn't want to be found. That's not what's interesting. What's interesting is why was he anxious about it? George was a smart man. He said, we want to be above 4 million. Well, why? 3.9 is close to 4. Why do you want to be above 4 million? As a signal to the British, they can't come back. We're a growing, strong country. And he literally told Thomas Jefferson to calculate some numbers, and, and a smart man too, and figure out exactly what he thought the right count would be. And he actually c controlled for the undercount. And, and sorted it out, and then went and made <laughs> and delivered this message to every, every diplomatic uh, uh, piece of core in, in Europe. Because what Washington was using the census to do is to protect the borders, oddly, um, at the security of the country. So let me give you another anecdote from 1790. Um, James Madison said, oh, we're gonna go talk to everybody. Why don't we ask some questions about other things than just who are you and how many of you and so forth and so on. And he said, why don't we ask a question about are you a farmer? Are you a, in commerce? Uh, are you a uh, manufacturer? Whatever. Do you make horseshoes? Or do you uh, grow crops and so forth? And the census, the, um, the Congress said, oh no, that's a waste of time. Uh, we don't need to know that stuff. And so they wouldn't let him put that question on the form. And um, Jefferson was the census director in effect, in a technical sense. Uh, uh, in the second census, he came back with the same argument. He was rebuffed again. The next census, and every census since, the Congress woke up and said, we need data. We need to know these things about our country. And so the, this, was in, this was the moment when you suddenly realize this phenomenon, this thing, this counting of the population is gonna drive the economy. They need these data in order to plan an economy and so forth and so on. And um, I'll give you one other um, anecdote. This is a Jefferson anecdote as well. Jefferson, who actually was kind of in charge of the 1790 census, did something without permission. It wasn't illegal, but he didn't have permission. He sent the enumerators into the Appalachian regions which weren't, weren't part of the 13, uh, we didn't have to count the people in the Appalachians for heaven's sakes. Um, uh, we have to count the people in the, in the 13 uh, new states and so forth for apportionment reasons and all that. So why is he doing that? Because there was discussion at the time in the federal government about whether the West, the West is now, once you get across, practically get across the Hudson River, but the West is everything out there. Why don't we colonize that and get all of the benefits for these people living along the coastal line, the 13 original states? And Jefferson had a very different vision. This is a country of free people. And so he had them count in, in, in Appalachian and Tennessee and Kentucky were the next two states added almost immediately, right after the census was over. In, in, in 94 and, 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 and 93, two new states. That secured the idea that you could not colonize. 
You had to only go with the free state. Now here are really brilliant men um, uh, uh, using this little tool, this little tool, that just people on horseback is going around and trying to find people somewhere, to worry about our security, to worry about what we knew about our population and, and how it could grow and what it was doing. In, 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 and, and then the Jeffersonian one, which is, and make sure that we build a democratic republic, not a colony. If we build a colony out there, we will be as corrupt as everybody else is. So that's how this thing got started, with b a big vision uh, of, of, of why you needed a census to build a democratic society. I want to emphasize that because by the time this is over, this conversation, we're going to have said an awful lot of things about the problems we're in now. So I just want you to have this background <laughs> to know that you know, we've been there, we figured it out, we've done it continuously since 1790, um, and we're really in a big, we've, we've got a new set of, we'll get to that, almost unique, almost unique problems. <laughs> but, but what's already been described is some of the initial initiatives to say we're going to fight back. We're going to get complete count committees, we're going to put some of our own money into it. Um, we're not going to let them take the census away from us which is really the Im implication of what, what's been said so far. I, I have my silver lining. Okay, I'm constantly looking for silver linings. And I want to build on what Ken just said, which is essentially that um, this is my fourth census. Um, and I have never seen this level of support, this level of uh, outreach on the part of the nonprofit community, the business, com the business community, um, the amount of support, the, I guess the, what we can say is that the question we get the most is what can I do? What do you want me to do? I want to help. We get random calls at my office. What can I do to help? Um, the uh, level of awareness is very, very high. And it makes me, you're going to hear a lot. <laughs> Perfect storm, analogy, all of that. But through all that, we do have really response from people that, in my view, at least my fourth census now, is really unprecedented. Well, we're going to um, delve more into uh, providing some historical perspective. But since you raised, I think, and I think in all of your comments, one of the things that emerges, at least for me, is a sense of urgency. And I wanted to give um, all of the panelists an opportunity to comment on that, if you wanted to comment on that further. What's the sense of urgency? Where is it coming from? What are the implications of that? Well, I I'm happy to start on that. Well, first of all, we talked a little bit about the citizenship question. And that obviously presents a sense of urgency, because there, if we lose the case, there are many who may be fearful to respond to that. So the city now is organizing in a number of different ways to prepare for that um, in, in case that happens. So let me talk a little bit about that. One is, um, not to be overly uh, legalese, but uh, the Title 13 of the US Code does protect the confidentiality of the census. And so we need to make sure that people understand that their information is indeed safe. Secondly, we need to make sure that people understand what's at stake. I mentioned this before. Why was this question added? It's very, cle it's very clear why it was added. It's insidious why it was added. And so are we going to give in to that, or are we going to fight back? And so without getting overtly political, if one really wants to stand up to the administration in DC, take the five minutes to fill the census out. That is one of the simplest and best acts you can do to protect uh, not only New York City, but our democratic principles uh, writ large. So we have a lot of things at stake. The other interesting part about the census that we have not talked about in 2020 is for the first time ever, you can answer the census online. This is revolutionary. It's really incredible because this will mean that between mid-March of next year and mid-May during the so-called self-response period, people will be able to go into a public library. They'll be able to take their phone out. They'll be able to fill this form out online. And the second new way that you can fill the form out is by phone. We are really excited about these two new options because it gives us tools as a city government that quite frankly didn't exist before. 
before. We are going to be getting from the Federal Census Bureau real-time 24-hour data broken down by census tract every single day. We're going to be putting that map online. People are going to be able to see how their neighborhood is doing and really hopefully take a sense of ownership of their community. So there are many different things that are happening in 2020 census that didn't exist before that do create a sense of real urgency. If I can add on to that, I would say that understanding that what is going to be able to be out happen when we get out to the point where we'll have so real-time data. Um, you know, the urgency on the ground is really making sure all the community organizations that we know, all of our mosques, all of our faith-based community understands the urgency and the importance of organizing for this. And we start building sort of the case right now for the community. So by the time we get to April next year, we, we already at a space that everybody understands the importance and they're ready to fill out. And we've already sort of come through some of the problems that we might or barriers we may come up against. Census talks, the census operation talks endlessly about trusted voices. A Census Bureau person is not inherently a trusted voice. You know, it's a bureaucrat from the government that's asking you questions. Uh, but when your church tells you, when the uh, uh, neighborhood tells you, uh, when the school tells you, when people you trust in the community are telling you, you've got to do this, it really matters, and, we're going, and you are protected, um, then you, you perk up. Uh, and I don't mean you as individuals, but the system will the system will start paying attention to trusted voices. So that's the mechanism. Fundamentally, it's use other people as, uh, as surrogates, if you will, to get the message out there. And and, and what what everybody's already said, there's enormous energy to do that. Um, it will not. Here's why it will be difficult. Um, uh, we have never done a census where the mood of the public about the census was as negative as it is today. Much of that negativity is not about the census. It's about privacy. It's about Facebook. It's about social media. It's a, it's a generalized, and it's about a mistrust of government. And it's about the deep experience and the painful experience on both sides of the polarization that's taking place. It's just a, it's a toxic moment uh, in, in, in our history. So to overcome that, if the census can overcome it, it will be a healing experience for the country. It's a big deal to sort of do something together, not for politics, but as a civic responsibility uh, to, for all the reasons that Washington and Hamilton and, and uh, Madison and Jefferson and et cetera, et cetera, et cetera knew. So there's a deeper message that you can communicate. Not only am I a trusted voice, but what you can trust me to do is to care about the country. And that's what I say. Don't let them take the census away without going into who them is. Uh, it's our census. It's the citizen census. We have low turnout elections, right? They still do what elections do. People get votes, they go to city councils, they go to the U.S. Rep uh, House of Representatives, whatever. There, there is no such thing as a low turnout census. It's an oxymoron. And so the fight is to sort of it, it just enthusiastically embrace the idea of a country like our democracy that really needs this thing. Well, I, I think many of us turn to history for perspective on some of these questions uh, that the panel is raising um, here. So I wanted to invite the panelists to comment on how this particular census experience uh, may or may not be different um, from uh, years in the past, how certain questions that are being raised perhaps uh, as part of this 2020 census um, are, uh, w how do they fit in historical perspective, whether it's the citizenship question or questions uh, about uh, immigration generally. So. Pass it over to you first. Please. Well, the, the, um, there are three censuses out there right now. One of them is the operational census. It's what's really being described. Uh, the complete count committees and all that. And the, the internet, a new, other kinds of innovations. The Census Bureau is very good about in innovating to sort of keep up with the declining response rate and has been doing that. Um, so that's an operational census. It only works if it's funded and it only works if the country really wants it. Then there's a second census or a second layer of the census and that's the partisan argument about it. And that is, as I just said, there's a certain toxicity associated with that which is really damaging to the census. And then there, unfortunately, is a third layer, which is disinformation, which is deliberate 
uh, uh, manipulation, of, if you will. And it's really easy. Okay? I get in my email something that looks like the census form. In fact, it is a picture of the census form. And it's a message from somebody, uh, the state of New York or the city or whatever, saying the census really matters. Please, please fill it out, get it in, and so forth. And don't forget, April 1st is Census Day. And if you don't get it in by April 1st, we don't bother. And it's mailed out on April 2nd. There are going to be a lot of people with that form still sitting on their desk. And they're going to say, well, it's, oh, I'm sorry, I wish I should have done that. I should have blah, blah, blah. Or the opposite. The same message is coming across, and it says, the census, care about it, do it. It's positive. And they don't actually need the data till December, which is actually, that's the first time we use the data product, is in December, months later. So, you know, don't worry about it. Just get it in sooner or later. That'll drive response rates down. That's, and the, I could give you worse examples of that, but those are simple. So you all, you've got to deal with this the census at these all three levels. How operationally sound is it is, and how well funded it is, and secondly, how much we will be able to control the partisan polarization that's eating away at it, and third is a disinformation campaign. And that is, that is going to be difficult to defend against. I think that's actually a really interesting way to sort of contextualize it. For us, for the Muslim American community, just a, in context, a little bit of background, um, there are about three and a half million Muslims in America, 1% of the population. We're very sure that there are more of us than have been counted in the past, so many of them are looking forward to participating in that way. But um, the community itself is very diverse. So there are 38% that are white, that is mostly Arab American, 28% Asian, that includes both Pakistani, Bangladeshis, as well as Malaysian, Indonesian, as well as the Uyghur Chinese. So it's a hugely diverse community. 28% are um, either African American or from the African communities, and 4% are a Latino community that is growing. Um, so very diverse, and as racially and social, like racially diverse they are, they're also socioeconomically diverse. Um, Muslim Americans, about 40% have a college degree or a postgraduate degree and are subsequently high income earners, but um, one third only have a high school education or less, um, and many of them, 50% percent live under the poverty limit. So those sort of, um, you know, financial issues as well as uh, linguistic and um, socioeconomic <laughs> issues are going to impact the way that they are comfortable um, with filling out a form. Linguistic issues are a big concern. Many of them are not literate in the language that they speak as well, or speak a language that there's no translation for. The um, census is translating, whether that's online or through paper products or having phone um, translators, only 59 languages, but there are 800 languages spoken in New York City, which just blew my mind. But but so that is a huge issue, and many um, people just don't have access to internet. How many people are going to be able to go to the library at open hours? How many people have a smartphone? Um, people may be fine FaceTiming somebody, but they're not comfortable filling out a form. So those barriers are definitely there, and I think the other piece is um, along the lines of misinformation. You know. Uh, in New York City, they did use publicly available census data in order to do NYPD surveillance of Muslim communities post 9-11. That still is a big part of the dialogue within the Muslim community and mistrust and the idea that we just don't want to participate because, yeah, you tell me that this is good for our community, but individually it's, it impacts me and it scares me. So um, getting past that barrier um, is going to be a lot of work. So. Well, a couple things. Um, there are a few new elements to this form. We mentioned one of them, the citizenship question, so I won't go into that because we don't know how that case will turn out. Um, but also, one thing that's new in terms of questions is that both married and non-married same-sex couples are recognized in this form. So this is fantastic and something that we really want to spread the word about to really galvanize the LGBTQ community to respond and to take ownership of that. So, you know, we were talking about the Muslim community. One of the things that's really interesting is in 2010, the neighborhood that had the highest response rate in New York City was Washington Heights and Inwood. And there, the community leaders, the elected officials, really did a door-to-door -door campaign during the self-response period to take pride in boosting the numbers as high as possible of the Dominican population. And they want to do that again. So, actually, I'm going to be in uh, Washington Heights on Friday 
Saturday night for an event, um, really to again try to get the community to rally around those issues. So it's also, it is a point of pride. I mean, making sure that everyone in the community stands up and is counted. So that's, you know, if you're to leave with one message tonight, that would really be one of them, um, to make sure that you're telling friends and neighbors how much is at stake on funding and on political representation as well. Yeah, I, I want to build on some of the comments that Ken just made on the, about the operational elements of the census, which is my area of expertise. Um, the Census Bureau is caught between a rock and a hard place. Um, if we work very closely with the Census Bureau and the career professionals. They want a census, a good census as much as we do. They're really in a very tough spot, <laughs> and I fear for them. If self-response does indeed tank, it's going to open up all kinds of problems, starting with the workload that the Census Bureau has to undertake when they send enumerators out. There has been an assumption in the Census Bureau's operational plan that they will need fewer people to go out and knock on doors. It's based on several things. Um, the use of administrative records, for example, um, in order to close out um, an enumeration of a household um, is one, one element in that. Um, so they are putting out, they are putting a plan out there which is based on an assumption that there'll be a certain level of response. If some of the factors, the forces that we're talking about, inhibit response, the internet's new. We all, you know, use it, right? But no one really knows. And let me say this, this goes back to 2011 and 2012, prior to this administration. The Census Bureau has been underfunded in its testing. A lot of the innovations we're hearing about, which are very good, have not really been scaled up and tested in a way that would, frankly, make the Census Bureau and us happy. Um, we had one test site in Providence County, Rhode Island. We should have had more than that. The fact is that we have internet now, first time, taking uh, enumerations over the phone, really the first time we're doing that. Um, paper's gonna be very limited. Um, 80% of the country is going to get a request to go on the internet to answer, 20% not. They'll get a paper form. If you don't answer after the fourth mailing, everybody gets a paper form. But actually, you can't get a paper form by calling up. And there are not going to be paper forms at post offices and in community centers like there were last time. It's the telephone, the internet, and this selective use of paper this time. That's new. Primary season. That's when the census is going to happen. The presidential election primary season. Will the voices that we're talking about to get people to go out and answer, will they be drowned out by the rhetoric that is likely to occur? All of these things are new and unique. Our hope is that we can muster up enough support in order to get the word out and in order to get people to understand that that service in the community center that they go and get, a health service, educational services in schools, they may go away. So far, the research is showing that that's what resonates the most, okay? The Title 13 stuff, most of what we're finding is that any mention of Title 13, pro or con, is, isn't, is, is discouraging people. It's about your impact on your day-to-day -day existence, your personal stake. When you, your child gets a service at a school that's funded, that service could go away for two reasons. One is the money doesn't flow, but secondly, the legislation, because we diluted our representation, the legislation doesn't get passed in order to allow for that service. So this is the approach that you know, we're talking about making it really, really personal. Um, what we're up against, we're up against a lot. And the Census Bureau is in a very difficult spot. Another big silver lining. Um, 
the business community needs these data. Uh, I don't think maybe most of you understand that the, one of the things that the census is, is the benchmark for all other surveys, all other surveys that are serious, including Bureau of Labor Statistics, Health Statistics, Education Statistics. That's the benchmark against which these other data uh, uh, products are calibrated to make sure they're reasonably accurate in terms of the demography of the population that's out there. And businesses really need to know. Uh, Walmart really needs to know whether they want to, what is this population growing out in this, this uh, Arizona town or not growing, and so forth and so on. They're not making as much public noise because they're in a bind, but I know they're there. Can yeah, and then I would just say on that note, the Association for a Better New York, which represents uh, many of the larger businesses in the city, is very actively involved in the census to that point. So they're, they're, they're going to be a, a, a lot of, a lot of inst not just the advocacy groups and the business, they're going to be people sort of, and organizations just pop up and say, when they realize that we're, we're at some risk of having a, a decent, acceptable uh, a census. Um, and so don't, don't, don't not do it because you hear a lot of bad news about it or it's going to be hard and so forth and so on, all of which is true. A place like the tenement house has got to stand for a good census, for heaven's sake. <laughs> and... Uh, and, and that, that will, if it comes together, if it goes viral, that, you know, the census is what we have to do as communities and churches and schools and businesses. If that, if that, if it is owned by the public somehow, rather than sort of owned by a bureaucracy somewhere in Washington, D.C., well, not quite in Washington, we know, um, but nevertheless, that, that's the message that if we can, if it gets out there forcefully enough, it, it can go viral. And the, the millennials can decide, we really want to have a good census, or that, the opposite. That may be happening now in Queens. Um, I've been out in Queens a lot. Um, uh, and I don't live in the borough, and I've been out there a lot, though. Um, Queens, as you know, is one of the most diverse places in the country. Okay? And they have 84 people that have come together and breaking up in various configurations in order to get the word out. And what they're latching on to is that diversity is a function of the data that we, pr that we get out of the census. And uh, I don't know if you, you guys know this, but there is a more inclusive question on the, f on the 2020 form. One of the biggest problems we had in 2010 was the Jamaican community um, came to us uh, and they said, uh, wait a minute, if I'm Hispanic, I can put who I am here, and if I'm uh, an Asian uh, I can, an Asian person, I can put down who I am. Where do I write down Jamaica? Now, uh, and same in, in the Italian community, actually, too. Uh, now, there's a check off for white, and you can write in. It's actually a race ethnic question. You can actually write in your group. And I put the question up for, every, for the group in Queens, and I said, if you don't get a response to, the, to this question, we have no way of demonstrating that Queens is indeed as diverse as you, as you believe it is. It's not enough to say you are. We have to demonstrate it. And we do that through the data. And that seemed to resonate. So that's, again, this idea that um, standing up for who you are and your community seems to be a theme that's developing here in New York as being quite important. Yeah, and I'll add on, because I know Julie mentioned that too. I think that one of the things with that write-in is that you can write as an Arab American who has to check off white that you're Syrian or Egyptian. And, you know, under Asian now, there's an option for writing Pakistani. And I think, you know, advocating for the sense of pride that you can say that there are a lot of us here and this is how many of us, but also that, you know, correlates to, you know, resources within the community. I know that there's, you know, funding for or like culturally appropriate programming, whether that's at a senior center or you know at the library, those type of things, and, and understanding that that impacts that kind of programming has been you know really it's really interesting to your point beforehand. Like you know the um, the uh, funders have really funded a lot of investigation into what kind of messaging works for the census, and that has been really a rich resource I think for many of the community to look at and understand what to use. Well, I think you all are 
are pointing out, making really explicit and clear the potential impacts of an undercount. And I was curious if anyone was familiar with any historical examples where there had been a census undercount and what that looked like to really sort of um, help us grapple with what, um, what the potential implications of an undercount might be. Well, the important piece of history here uh, is, as I said, George Washington thought there was an undercount. Everybody assumes in a census going all the way from 1790 to 1940, and I'll get to 1940 in a second. We don't get everybody. We do the best we can and so forth. But you, you, do, you don't, you, we don't have any, we don't have a second census, right? So how does the, without a second census, how do you know how well the first census worked? What are you going to compare it to? 1940, we had obligatory a, a draft enrollment for males between the ages of 18 and 34. <coughs> We compared that number to what we'd gotten in the census. And the huge finding was not that there was an undercount, because I always presumed it was 2 or 3% in that neighborhood. It was differential. It was 7% for the African po American population and 1.5% for the white population. Uh, and that was the two big population groups in 1940, of course. Um, and so the differential undercount is what creates injustice in the society because some people are going to get penalized and other people are going to get rewarded. Um, and so um, the, the, the undercount then became something you could study. And so then every census since, since 1940, we've gone out and measured it. And what happened from 1940 to 19, uh, well, really 80 and 90, and then 2000 is the census I know best, but across that period is that the undercount went down and down and down but the differential never moved. It was 4% different. And so even though you got better at reaching the population, you differentially got better, or you, you got better at the same level of, of an, uh, across that whole period. And so, we, we, yes, we counted 98% of the population, but not 98% of the African-American population and, and then the other kinds of diverse groups that have come into society since and so forth. That's a whole different story. Um, so the, the real critical thing is, is what has now been stressed already. People got to take pride in wanting to be counted, and they also got to you know about the economic benefits and the political benefits, but they also simply want to say, we're here. It's what George Washington wanted to say to the British. We're here. We're growing. We're big. We're, take, pay, look at us. Pay attention to us. And groups like that. And, uh, and that's one of the things that keeps, keeps us from really losing the census, is that, that sort of sense of ident identification. And the census, as the question has already been said, the census bearer question this time is better on that capacity to in, in, uh, identify yourself. Um, it's not as good as it should be, and that's a different story, but it couldn't get better. Um, but uh, it, it really gives an awful lot of individual groups and the LGBT thing and so forth can kind of to come out in, in effect. Anyone else have they want anything they want to add? To I just want to stress that um, if you go back to 1990, the undercount, the official undercount in New York City was 3.2 percent, about 244,000 people. And the thing I want to stress is in 2000 and in 2010, the net undercount in New York City was zero. So what do you make of that? What Ken just said, though, is, is that that zero is made up of a whole bunch of people that are missed and a whole bunch of people, yes, that are double counted. Okay, Staten Island's double counted. Uh, person 65 and over, a lot of duplication, okay? Address problems enter the here. Uh, very ambitious people who uh, like to fill out census forms. <laughs> <laughs> and they can't be deduplicated for one reason or another. Um, so you wanna guess what that, what happens is that communities like Bedford-Stuyvesant, the historic the black communities of the city historically have had the lowest response rates, okay? Those tend to be undercounted, and the non-Hispanic white communities with older populations tend to be overcounted. So the net zero is meaningless. It's what happens in the neighborhoods, and in the neighborhoods, there is, uh, in effect, uh, a differential, which is very serious. Why? I know personally why. When an agency asks me to go out and set a help them establish a priority, I have weak numbers in one place and maybe not so weak numbers in another place. We send them one place and maybe we should be sending them some other place, so to speak. A number of uh, you know, poor 
children, uh, for example. Uh, children have been, uh, young children have been historically undercounted in the census and compound that with black response rates and you've got a real problem in some of the communities of the city. Um, the problem I mentioned earlier in Northwest Queens, we had to do our own adjustments of the population in a few areas in Northwest Queens and Southern Brooklyn because vital rates could not be calculated for those places. If they were calculated using the existing census base, that is the base from the decennial census, we would have declared epidemics in these places when they really did not exist, okay? So that's the kind of stuff that happens with the differential that Ken is talking about. Um, you always need to keep that in mind, that, that overall number masks differences by neighborhood in New York. And, and I would just say one more thing on that. In the 2010 census, uh, over a million children nationwide were left out of the census, the majority of whom were under five. And that's why when the question is asked, well, what is the number one community that is generally undercounted, it's children under five. This has grave implications. Head Start funding is based on uh, census data. Right now, as many of you know, we have a measles outbreak in New York City. Uh, the New York City Health Department relies on census data to quickly determine in a health emergency, well, how many vaccines do they need to order? This information is absolutely vital. And so that is why it's so important that we get it right. The big benefits from the census, which are uh, seats in the House of Representatives, Electoral College votes, and $800 uh, billion, um, uh, the big benefits um, are, are allocated proportionally, not in absolute numbers, are put differently. If you counted 150% of the population and only 50% of the population, you would say that's a huge failure. We didn't count half the people in the country. However, if you counted 50% of every block in the, in the country, it would work just as well as if you counted 100%. It's the differential that, that creates the injustices and, and, the, and the mixed opportunities, like the Head Start uh, case, which is mentioned. Um, uh, so but you, since you, you can't c be confident you will get exactly 50% of every block, every demographic group, every geographic region, and so forth, then you've got to go for 100% because that's the, that's the fail safe, and that's, it's hard to get to 100%. Uh, but if you don't go to that 100% effort, then you really, by definition, are creating in, uh, d deep differences and injustices in, 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 in our democracy. And that's, it, it matters for critically that we go all of the way. And the last 2% cost a lot. Um, uh, but but you've got to keep working at it. And, and now, you, as it's been said, and on, operationally, this census is going to make more use of administrative records, and uh, and I just and third-party data, uh, that is data that we're going to get from the commercial sector. The address file, as Joe knows, the address file for this census was largely put together by Google <laughs> Maps, and not knocking on the doors, and that was a really important partnership between the Census Bureau and the commercial sector, and we're fairly certain. It, Fairly certain, I don't know if Joe is, but fairly certain it's, it was a success. We won't know till we get to the field if it was. Um, but that's kind of in our future, uh, is, a, is a deeper census because we have all the administrative data and because we have all the other ways in which we learn about our society. Uh, but that's, that's, it's really complicated to get those data sets put together because there, some of them are for profit making, not for r running a, a just society. But we, we'll go to work on that, and I think that's, I, 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 look, I, I'd say one, I'm sorry, <laughs> but what, I'm really very deeply, deeply worried about the quality of the census in, in, in 2020. Um, uh, and I think one of the outcomes of that may be, let's don't ever let this happen again, which means the 2030 census will have much, much stronger capacity to resist, if you will. Uh, and there are groups already thinking about how we will, if, if that happens, if we have really not a good census in 2020, uh, we simply cannot let the country continue to go. The commercial b uh, players won't let us, they won't let us have bad numbers. Uh, they, they, they need them. Okay, quickly, I just want to build again on what Ken said. Um, I can assure you that New York City probably has the best address list in the census that it's ever had. And here's why. About three years ago, the Census Bureau gave us 
uh, gave really all the jurisdictions in the country counts of housing units out of the master address file by block as if they were going to take the census at that time. We then went out in a very big field operation for two and a half years and looked at all of the blocks in the city. And uh, I'm sorry, not all the blocks. That would be insane. There are almost 40,000 of them. <laughs> we went to about 15% of all the blocks in the city that we deemed to be high risk. And we fixed, we got prepared to fix the address list when we received it. We get the address list for 45 days, um, <laughs> three and a half million addresses. We took two and a half years to prepare to attack that task. In other words, when we got the list, we knew exactly where to go and exactly what to do, what blocks, and we fixed the addresses in a, many blocks, added 122,000 addresses that were not there, and corrected, corrected over 50,000 addresses, okay? where they're generally in the wrong block. We fixed them, the geocoding errors. So we have literally been out in the field checking all of this for several years now. The task is to get the people in those units to come forward and answer. We got the units on the list. Because in 1990, one of the big problems, this is before we reviewed address lists, there were a whole bunch of addresses just missing, several hundred thousand missing from the list. Okay, and that's one cause, one of the big reasons for the undercount. I can't resist one more thing. Um, <laughs> it's really troubling to me. Joe is probably the best person in the country to do what he is doing for New York City. He really is a resource. Uh, so I have to worry about thousands of other cities, you know, <laughs> who don't have a Joe Salvo and don't, didn't go to work two and a half years ago to try to get ready. So we can be feeling really good about New York, but, uh, but uh, Tampa and Dallas and Houston and lots and lots of other places, uh, you know, for whatever reason. Um, you did have webinars. I <laughs> 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 bet you did. Yeah. You, you, you would try. You would try. I bet. Anybody would ask. <laughs> but personality, you're right. Yeah. Getting the block information. Yeah. Yeah. Even in big cities. Before we open it up to questions, I want to invite the panelists to share anything um, that they felt has left, been left unsaid. I'm going to say this. You know, it, it does seem very bleak, and it's like a, this huge mountain that seems really um, you know, horrible. But I do think it's an opportunity, especially for many of our communities, to empower themselves and say, you know, we are here. We are going to be counted, and we are going to use those numbers to advocate for ourselves. And I think, you know, local, like I'm working here in New York, but we are doing webinars nationally with many other communities that are trying to get on, uh, started on doing this work. And I think that, you know, technology has offered an opportunity to share resources and ideas. And, and um, you know, it's fascinating to me. We talked about the census as funding different things. They're also funding ethnic media as well as, like, social media influencers and I think that is pretty amazing so to think about you know how you can touch upon you know young millennials are like frequently the least likely to respond to these things we want like college students and postgrads to respond so I do think you know it is an opportunity and we're trying to tackle it from different ways and we have the time to do so um, and then one last thing I would just add you know the diversity that we have in the city is amazing and it does make it difficult but I think that diversity is something that we will be utilizing and um, for engage we have a really wonderful young professional community that really wants to give back and we're hoping to mobilize them almost like in a get out the vote style to get out the count and go out with their smartphones to help communities that don't have those smartphones and sort of help people. Um, language is probably the one resource, but I'm thinking, you know, Google Translate may be able to help us. So, you know, there is opportunity, and I think looking to see if you can make sure you fill out your form, but also, you know, help others. Well, there's so many ways to get involved. First of all, you can form, and you heard this term before, a complete count committee, which is really just a very loose uh, terminology of helping your neighborhood, helping your friends and neighbors get counted. Um, you can come, if you, you want to help, you can go to the city's website for the census, which is nyc.gov 
backslash census. So nyc.gov backslash census. We would love to have your help. We need every New Yorker to get engaged by this. And it's really very simple and easy steps you can take to make sure that, you know, just thinking about the, the building you might live in, that, the, that your neighbors know that when that form comes in to please fill it out. Anecdote: The one thing you can count on is the Census Bureau. It will do its part of it as best it can. Under the it, it, and here's my anecdote: In 2000, um, uh, census taker, this is in Phoenix, uh, went and knocked on the door and didn't get an answer and knew could hear and knew somebody was there and knocked on the door louder and sooner or later a man opened up and he said, "You're from the census. I do not want to cooperate with the census. You're not going to and get off of my property." and don't come back. And if you do, I'm not gonna shoot you, um, but I'm gonna have my, and he had a big, huge uh, garden hose. You're gonna get drenched. <laughs> so the next day, the door, he hears somebody knocking, he comes out and there she is with an umbrella and a raincoat. <laughs> and he cooperated with her. <laughs> so, yeah. Hard not to cooperate in that. <laughs> <laughs> in that circumstance. Well, we're going to open it up to questions. So if anybody here in the audience has a question, please raise your hand. We have staff uh, here that will bring a microphone to you. Yeah. Hi. Thank you, everybody. This has been really enlightening and interesting. So something that you said um, made me wonder something. So you said that if we had a perfect count of 50% of the blocks in the country, that that would be as good as a perfect count of all of them because it, if it was representational. So it made me wonder, like, does it make sense to try to count every single person in the country every 10 years? I know the Constitution requires it, but would we be just as good trying to do a, a very good random sampling? Uh, yes, except we, they won't let us. <laughs> we, we tried to use sampling and in two thirds. Right, that was under your... Yeah, and yeah we, 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 the, the, the truth of the matter is, a, a good, well-done sample is more accurate than a census. If you ask yourself, you want to you want to do a census of how many people are walking up and down the street out here, and you're out there counting, 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 and not trying to get sleepy or whatever, whatever, whatever. At the end of the day, you're going to make mistakes. But if you draw a sample, and we know the properties of that sample statistically, and uh, and we know how to make sure what the error term is, uh, then you actually have a more accurate count using a. a, a because one thing, if you did a sample of the hard to count, which is what we were going to do, um, we would have then spent the very best enumerators into those neighborhoods where we had to find those people, very individuals who had not yet cooperated and so forth and so on. And they would have worked at it. They would have gotten their raincoats on if they had to or whatever it took. And um, so yes, it's a great question, but uh, right now it's not in the cards. Yeah. Went to the Supreme Court. Hi, thank you everyone. Um, I wanted to ask any of you if you can run through the systematic informa information campaign to educate the public that it's coming and what to expect and can you also explain what is the you know advertising strategy because I know just the four or five people that I told I was coming here tonight everyone's clueless. They don't understand what it is, why it's needed. They know what, you know, they, they've heard about it, but they really are completely clu clueless as to when it is, what, what it's for, and how it impacts them. Sure, I think that's a great question, so I'm happy to answer that. So it's really interesting. I chaired Community Board 1 in Lower Manhattan in 2010, and during that time, no one from the city or state or federal government ever came to a single one of our meetings to say, from a messaging standpoint, if you don't take the five minutes to fill this form out, did you know that you're going to lose funding for your local public school, your senior center, Medicaid, infrastructure, you, know, you can name any Head Start, any program you could name, it would be dependent on that. Instead, the only messaging that we ever heard was it's in the Constitution, it's the law, it's your civic duty to fill it out. Well, this is why people don't vote. Okay, it, that's not particularly compelling. So uh, from a messaging strategy, we, the city government, are going to completely change the messaging around this. We are going to focus on the funding piece because it is our firm belief 
that what is really going to motivate people is if they understand that funding to their community, to the programs that are so near and dear to their hearts, is at stake here. We're also going to focus on the political representation piece because people deserve to get the political representation um, th you know, that they need and, that, and we want to make sure that that piece comes across as well. So what you're going to see from the city of New York is rather, um, I don't want to call them incendiary, but sort of light a fire under people messaging to tell them what is at stake. We're doing micro-targeted ads in communities throughout the city that focuses on hyper-local issues that communities care about. So for example, uh, Lower Manhattan or in Rockaway, in communities that have dealt with really difficult issues regarding resiliency and emergency preparedness, we're going to focus on messaging around that. We're going to focus for the public school um, population to, to parents who are going to care very deeply about funding for their children's education. So that's the kind of messaging that we're going to do. The federal government has a contract with Young and Rubicam. They're doing nationwide advertising, despite our best efforts to convince them that in New York City, the messaging is different than in Peoria, Iowa, you know, they're not going to change the messaging. So the messaging is what it is. So we are going to do hyper-local targeted messaging. And so you will, you're not going to see it now, but come 2020, I'll be very disappointed if you tell me that you did not see your ads because we are going to be blanketing <laughs> the city of New York with our ads. This was amazing, really, really useful um, for me in some courses I'm teaching at John Jay, and I'm already making notes of students and who they can contact and they're in the panel right now because they're going to find you useful. I actually have one student, she's writing an essay. This is for a housing and equity class. She's writing an essay on basement apartments. So I want to know, <laughs> <laughs> I want to know, like in, you were talking about the addresses. How did you get the basement addresses in there, or do you have them? <laughs> uh, I'm, I'm going to try to do this in like just two minutes. Um, this all started in 1994 with the Address System Improvement Act was passed by the Congress. It gave us the ability to review the Census Bureau's address list. Um, it's, we have to sign a confidentiality agreement. It's very strict. Um, we get the address list and we get to give the Census Bureau comments and we review the list. 1996, 97, New York City had one telephone company. How about that? We got their engineering files, okay? We worked with the engineers at what was then Bell Atlantic to look at every single line that went into every single house. And we deduplicated those lines so that we could figure out how many apartments were getting service, had what we call landline service, okay? And that broke us, that, that was the breakthrough. But essentially what that did was it gave us thousands of apartments that we, we did not have. And we had pretty solid evidence that they were there because they were getting, we had accounts, they're getting individual phone service. So that, that is what started it. And we continue our um, uh, taxation and finance records have gotten better, okay? But if we did not have that data as a base for moving forward, I don't know if we would have ever been able to track uh, and try to figure out how many apartments there are. Hello. Um, you mentioned two different threats to the census, one being extreme partisanship and then the next being misinformation campaigns. Um, I had always sort of assumed those two went hand in hand, that it was partisans who were spreading the disinformation, but to the extent that it's not partisan organizations, who is spreading disinformation and why? Um, we don't know yet. Quite I mean, nobody knows. Um, and. Uh, and we suspect it will be partisan if it hurt. But on the other hand, uh, just sort of messing up the economy, if you're a trading uh, a partner with us who doesn't like the way we're running our international you know, tariffs and so forth, they can mess up our economy really easily. And so you could have a motivation which isn't narrowly partisan in the sense it's trying to favor the Democratic Republican uh, Party. So that's, what I, what I, that's why I keep it somewhat separate. Um, the, the citizenship question is very partisan and, um, and that's, that's, why, that's how we're watching it. But we, we, we've not, it's like the 2016 election. 
What was a disinformation campaign before you figured it out after the fact? And what is one for the census until you figure it out after the fact? One of the kind of small little footnotes in, in this, if it is partisan, the Census Bureau itself will be basically <laughs> prohibited from fighting back because it would turn the census into a political organization. And they just can't do it. They just simply cannot touch anything that looks like or could smell like them being having a, a partisan strategy. Uh, so that means the private sector is going to have to do it. And we're now trying to organize teams who can find it quickly uh, once it's out into the system and then have some emergency squads ready to sort of do the messaging, whatever it would turn out to be, in order to counteract it. Um, we're, we're in the dark, but there's already a lot of noise in, in, the, in the netherworld of the, of the Internet. We know that people are paying attention to it and thinking about it. We've sort of seen that. thing on that. I mean, we did talk obviously about the citizenship question, but it, it's very clear what is going on there. The pretext for that the Trump administration gives for why Secretary Wilbur Ross needed to add the citizenship question was to enforce the Voting Rights Act. I, I mean, nothing about that question enables one to enforce the Voting Rights Act. And to say that that administration, that that's their pretext, you know, it's just really troubling. And, and that is why we need to make sure that people understand what is going on here and why it's so important to get involved in the census. The census is obviously supposed to be nonpartisan. I mean, we are counting every single New Yorker, but what we don't want to happen is if we lose this case before the Supreme Court, we don't want what they're trying to do, which is to intimidate people. We don't want that fear to take hold. On the contrary, we want people to stand up and say, I deserve to be counted. Everyone deserves to be counted. No one deserves to be invisible. And that's really what the whole census in 2020 is about for the city of New York that has an immigrant population of 3.2 million people. I just wanted to add one other piece that there is some concern about fraud, so making sure as part of the information campaign that people know that they're not going to ask your social security number, they're not asking for a banking number, and that's part of just sort of the general education campaign um, that we're doing in communities and I'm hearing about. Hi, just as a, um, I guess I want to, to go back onto your statement about if, what if you do lose the case, what are the protections for people? Sure. Because some people like, I don't want to fill this out to be the sure. test case in case someone uses yeah. that as a way to come after me. I mean, it's all well and good to yeah. say, yes, stand up and fight, but how does that individual family deal with that? So you know? Title 13 of the U.S. Code is a statutory provision that is absolutely ironclad since its enactment it has protected the confidentiality of the census. It actually imposes up to five years prison sentence, up to $250,000 penalty on any federal census employee who shares that data, and that's actually a lifetime ban. So if that federal census employee quits the government the next day, that ban still is imposed on that individual. It is ironclad. It has not, since its enactment, been broken. So we really need to make people uh, sure of that. Probably the number one question I'm asked at every single forum, and it hasn't come up yet, so I will proactively um, bring it up, is people say, well, what if I don't want to answer that question? Yeah. Now, it, it is very clear in the law that we cannot encourage people to not fill out any question. In fact, that that I is not legal. So, you know, in answering that question, what we say to people and the advice that we have received directly from the regional director of the Federal Census Bureau is if someone does skip a question, their form will still count. If someone skips the majority of questions, their form will not count and they're likely to get someone knocking on their door. So legally, we will never, the city of New York, engage um, in a civil disobedience campaign to urge people not to answer you know, any question. Look, there's a gender question on there that's binary. Are you male? Are you female? There are some who will find that offensive and may opt not to answer that question. What we're really focused on is encouraging New Yorkers to fill out the census, to make sure that they fill it out, because by skipping the census entirely, you're just disenfranchising your own community. 
conversation about what is the strategy here. The Hispanics are certainly having this conversation. And uh, one, of the com one of the strategies being discussed um, um, is everybody says I'm a citizen. It would make the data useless because we know it's not true. But you couldn't, so you wouldn't be able to use that item. Uh, you would go ahead and get the census data of the citizen while we're already getting it from administrative records from the ACS. But if something like that happened, if the millennials decided to take on the census for that, and, uh, and, and decided to sort of go out and organize, uh, everybody is a citizen of this country if they're here, blah, blah, blah. Uh, then, then that would make the, the, the item itself. Uh, the Census Bureau couldn't report it because they would know it was so grievously wrong. Or everybody skip it, yeah. not, not, just, uh, not just the uh, immigrant and, and, and let alone the eagle. Everybody skip that question. Um, and there is a lot of strategic thinking about, it. but how you get that message out and whether people will get it, it's, it's, it's complicated, needless to say. Yeah, and I've been part of those conversations where everyone felt like saying, you know what, in solidarity, we are just gonna skip the question. Um, and I think that, you know, if you don't feel comfortable with a question, don't answer it. Because we need, you know, we need the fact that you're, how many people live in your household, we need the race question, we need certain information, household and owner, those seem really innocuous. But, you know, if you don't feel comfortable with the citizenship question, if you have issues with and concerns with the, whatever partisan politics is being put into the census, I think that you can just skip it, and, and that's a choice. And I think people will choose to do so even if they are a census a citizen or not. Exactly, the only thing we don't want is for people to skip many questions. Because yeah. if you skip two or more questions, your form as we have been told by the Federal Census Bureau, will not count. So we really want to be very, very clear about the messaging on that. Yeah, uh, I'm just curious. How many of you know that the citizenship question does not ask anything about legal status? It asks you as to whether you're a citizen or not. It doesn't ask anything about legal status. Do you guys know that? <laughs> yeah, be, uh, it, it's really amazing that I've been surveying my, my taxi drivers. Um, I always do that. <laughs> yeah, and um, uh, it's amazing. Uh, several Dominican taxi drivers I've had uh, do not know that. They, they are assuming that they're going to be asked whether they are legal or not. And so it just goes to show when, the misinf when misinformation gets out there and it proliferates, people are afraid of something that really not even there, um, you know, that, I mean, obviously the question has now become a, a hot, you know, a hot button item, so to speak, right? But it is, it's interesting that a lot of people really don't know that. What is the wording? Um, it's actually several categories, um, starting with your citizen, and then ask you if you're in that, uh, uh, you know, I, I can't really go into that. Besides on the that's 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 Naturalized, whether you're naturalized or not. And by the way, historically, right, People don't know what naturalized means, um, and that creates problems on the American Community Survey. Uh, and then, and then the, the last category is non -citizen, you're not a citizen. But it's like three or four steps in that process, none of which involve um, legal status. Okay. Um. First of all, just thank you so much for this because this was all very informative. I didn't know a lot of this before coming here. Um, I was just curious if you could speak a little bit more on collecting third party data because um, especially now with all the privacy concerns about like data mining and things like that, like I would want to know more what that entails and how you would address like the privacy concern aspect of it. That, that's a very big deal. Um, uh, and. Uh, the people who are thinking systematically about this are not thinking about it in the context of the 2020, and they're thinking about it going forward. Already, a very large number of our economic statistics are using third-party data. They're using swipe data, and they're using uh, transaction data, of the bank transit. And there's a ton of economic information out there in this society. And so the, 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 uh, the Fed the, uh, and, and the various economic units of the, of the thing are using those data already. They have the dangers that, lots of dangers, but certainly one of them is the privacy thing. But the people who are managing this are fierce on the privacy question. Because if, if they don't keep it private, then um, it'll blow up, and we know that. Um, and I think the, 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 the economic statistics are just the sort of the first step of this. 
and we're gonna get better and better and better at it, and that's why I say by 2030, it'll be a much bigger part of this. But there are many, many issues, one of which is the, the commercial players can game us if we're not careful. Here's a sentence I sometimes use, uh, um, that by 2030, the Census Bureau will be more, do more curating of data than collecting of data. And what I mean by curating, they will say, that's a good data file on education, that's a good data file, because there are going to be lots and lots of data, tons and tons of data. And you see it, and you know, every, 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 uh, uh, every uh, light post in, in towns and cities is now measuring every time. If we do uh, congestion, pri uh, con congest congesting traffic controls here, the amount of data that that's going to produce is enormous. So how are you going to use it intelligently? <laughs> Um, uh, to create a more safe state, safe streets, or whatever it would be, so it's going to happen. But 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 I can only assure you that the people working on it have in mind privacy, coverage, comprehensiveness, a cost. You can save a lot of money if the data already exists, um, and 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 social justice to do it in such a way that you don't leave out population groups that that might get left out. as enumerators, because they can talk to other non-citizens and we're precluded from doing that. Thing. So that's a big setback. Yeah. And I think that, that some of the community organizations are asking for funding so that they can, uh, because they can hire non-citizens to help support um, so that it comes through that way rather than just enumerating. Um, uh, again, like thank you for your time today. Um, I just want to know, um, now that the world is so like connected to social media and like Twitter, Instagram, Facebook is so like intrinsic in our daily lives, do you think that the awareness about like how important the census is should be moved to these platforms in the same way that like voting has been? Or do you think that that would be? No, it's a great question. We're definitely going to be doing a tremendous amount on social media, digital ads, an enormous part of our advertising and marketing strategy is focused on just that. 
we're also focusing on influencers, on those who have a very large Twitter or Insta following, and that so we can make sure that during the response period of mid-March to mid-May that they're posting on their accounts to really galvanize people to fill it out. And that's one point that I forgot to make. I mean, it, it, one great way to help, I mean, obviously contact us in the city, and I gave you all our website, but there are other ways to help as well. You know, because you can answer on your phone, like your uh, teachers and, and others who are part of civic organizations or a faith-based organization, make sure that the leader of your organization between mid-March and uh, mid-May at every single meeting, at every single class is announcing, have you filled out the census? If you haven't, go to and then give the website and literally in two minutes that person can like go on, they fill out the 10 questions and boom, they're done. So there's so much that we can do every single day during that eight-week period to make sure that everyone has filled it out. We have time for one more question, if anybody has a final question. How many of you think it's likely that the leadership of our two parties, the President of the United States, uh, along with the Speaker of the House, um, will jointly appear on, say, March 15th and say the census is coming, it really matters, everyone should contribute their opinion? <laughs> None Has of that you ever happened? Of course. <laughs> it's always happened. No, you've never, never had a census where the entire political apparatus didn't want to have a good census and have good numbers. Never uh, had that. Uh, and so if you sitting in this room can't imagine that happening, then the only solution is to create that same urgency about it with all the things that's been discussed up here. Because you're not going to get it from the top. You're going to have the President of the United States, after the Supreme Court hearing on the citizenship question, said that if the citizenship question isn't asked, this will be a meaningless census. What's that mean? Well, I mean, yeah, well, well, and if it's a meaningless census, this is a man with 40%, 35% of the population is part of his base and so forth. Is he saying to them, don't bother to fill it out because it's meaningless without that question? I, we, it, it's uncharted territory, <laughs> is the point. Any parting thoughts anyone wants to <laughs> share on top of that? <laughs> Great. Well, I think we're out. Oh, did you, did you want to say anything? Okay. <laughs> want to give everybody the chance to say everything they have to say on the subject. Um, well, that we're just about out of time. Uh, so I want to thank all the panelists for being here this evening and sharing all of their expertise. <laughs> and thank all of you for being here as well and sharing all your um, questions. Thanks. Is that our word?